Be the right club. Be the right club today. Yes! Again, has to be careful of the speed. What a comeback season for Hal Sutton. Right back toward the hole. How about in? That's the second eagle he's made it for this week. <laughs> 17 years later, Hal Sutton is the players' champion. Our next guest on the Be The Right Club Today podcast is Mr. Michael Breed. Michael was the 2012 PGA Teacher of the Year. He's been a host of many um, very successful uh, lesson series from the Golf Fix on the Golf Channel. He's currently the host of A New Breed of Golf, course record with Michael Breed, and he's the Chief Digital Instructor for Golf Digest. Michael, welcome on. Chase, thanks so much. I appreciate it. It's good to, it's good to be with you and Al. So Michael, first question. You used to be assistant pro at one of the most famous courses in the world. Tell us about being assistant at Augusta National. Um, it's a couple things. First of all, um, it back when I was, was there, this is sort of the late 80s, early 90s, uh, the game of golf was just kind of just starting to get going. And I'll, I'll, I'll bring back to, to uh, your memory some of the fun times. It was the launch of the Wilson Whale. <laughs> and titanium drivers with paint coming in, if you remember that, right? That's when the head was really starting to change. There was also that J driver that uh, Jumbo Ozaki uh, was using, as well as Ray Floyd. Um, right. the, the head of the driver was about, well, it wasn't quite the size of a five wood now. <laughs> um, so it was, it was a different time. Uh, the game was starting to become really popular. And John Daly um, had just won the PGA Championship. They were trying to figure out, and you've stood on that, that range, the East Range um, at Augusta National uh, is, was where Hogan used to practice. The West Range is over to the left-hand side of Magnolia uh, Lane as you're driving in. And um, everybody was trying to figure out how to get how to how to keep golf balls from landing on Washington Road. Um, so that was sort of the time. It was also a time where um, you know the Masters was really starting to um, lead the way in television. It was the first time I had ever seen high def TV, and uh, was at Augusta National. Um, so it was a, it was a, a very different time in our sport and the game was really starting to, you know, there was a heavy, and you know, this, there was a heavy push for all of us to try to do what we could do to grow the game of golf as, as well as we could. And for those of us that were playing the game, um, we never really got into the game with the idea of, I got to grow the game. It was, I got to beat the guy that I'm playing all of a sudden now is you got to grow the game. So it was, it was a totally different mindset and thank God for it because the game has grown and has now flourished into what we get to experience today. And thank God for Tiger Woods and, and John Daly and Jack Nicholas and all these other individuals that, that um, brought us these unforgettable uh, moments in the game of golf, you included. Uh, so what was it like being a, a, at Augusta national at that time? It was everything you'd hope to be. I can tell you this, this is the simplest way to say this. I never had more best friends in my entire life than when I was working at Augusta National. <laughs> I had so many people call me up and go, hey, Michael, I'm going to be in Augusta. Is there any way I can come by and play? And I go, where, like this one guy, where are you? He goes, well, I'm in Minnesota, but if you invite me down to play, I'd be happy to come down. <laughs> <laughs> so I bet um, you had a lot of calls about playing at Augusta. I did. I did. And fortunately, uh, they set it up so that we were never in an uncomfortable situation. Um, but it was, it was everything you'd hoped it would be. It was the cool thing for me. It was, it, it was the thing that led to hope 
when you were at Augusta National as an assistant golf professional, and I was sort of at the time where I was, you know, I got into golf kind of late, and um, I was trying to figure out if I was good enough to be able to play for a living. So the, the Ben Hogan tour was just starting up, and um, I was working at Augusta National from basically uh, the October time frame until sort of the latter part of May. And then I would go and catch up with the Ben Hogan tour and the four spotters that they had weren't four spotters, but they were 14 and, and 15 spotters. So it was, it, was, it was available. And so what I did was through the summertime, I, I just traveled uh, getting into tournaments through the, through the qualifiers and, you know, playing with, Again, John Daly was on that tour when I first started. Tom Lehman, Joe Durant, all those guys. Uh, the Gallagher brothers um, were, were doing that game. So it was, it was also at a time where if you didn't play well, you didn't make any money. And you, you quickly found out in a very short period of time that if you, didn't, if you didn't come in the top five week to week, you couldn't sustain. But what it did was there was hope for me in playing and there was hope for me if I don't, if I don't make it, I've got Augusta National to fall back on, and that really is something special uh, for me. So I kind of was at a, at a moment where no matter what I did, my, my future was, was in a really good situation. Uh, the people couldn't have been better. The doors that were opened as a result were phenomenal. And I, I will say this. It was the only place that I've ever worked in my life where every single person that showed up on a property was in a great mood. And that that was, there's nothing like it in the whole wide world. Everybody was excited to get to work. Everybody that was coming to play was excited to, to be there. Obviously, it's the, it's the best adult playground that there ever is or was. And I was very, very fortunate and, and proud to, to be on that, uh, on that staff. How long were you there? I worked four full years. Um, and I worked 13 tournaments. So I started working there in 1989 and worked all the way through Tiger's uh, 2001 um, win, which was, I think, probably the, the greatest major feat ever in the history of the game with carrying the opportunity, as you know, to have all four majors at once. And then that time between the PGA Championship and, and Masters, um, it's not a month. It's more like eight months. And he knew that for that amount of time and then still went out there and, and beat the best and and then actually went on to win the players, as you well know. Yeah. Michael, as a, as a young assistant pro, how often did you get to play? So I played whenever I possibly could. And again, understanding that I was trying to play uh, the Ben Hogan Tour. I can remember they had a tournament called the Macon Open which was played um, the Monday after Masters. And when Masters rolled around at that time, we worked seven straight weeks in a row. I didn't get a day off for seven weeks. And I asked my head pro, we had co-head pros, Bob uh, Klecky and Dave Spencer. And I asked Dave, could I go to try to qualify for the make and open? It was the Monday after Masters. And he said, Normally, he, he wouldn't allow people to do that. But he said, look, if you want to go over there, if you think that you can qualify, you know, go do it. And literally, Masters ended on Sunday. I drove over to the Macon Open, which was, I don't know how many hours, um, with a guy named Dave Dallenberg, who, who was a caddy at Augusta National and was fortunate enough to, to I would, I, believe it or not, during Masters week, I would do all my work and then I would go to the back of the range where the net was to keep the balls onto the range. And I would hit balls into the net after work for an hour that entire master's week. So we would end our responsibilities at about 9.30. I would hit balls until about 11 o'clock at night, go home, get up at 4.30, get to work at 5.15 and start it all over again and went over and actually qualified um, for the for the tournament didn't make the cut I was a little fatigued but I did I did qualify um, for it so you know it was uh, it was any chance I could to play and obviously you know it's it's Augusta National but any chance I could get to play I would play and I was also playing you know I was playing pretty well I, I remember playing um, one weekend over there on a Saturday, Sunday, they, they, they have um, what they call the member games. So on Saturday and Sunday, because the large majority of the membership 
is non-resident. Um, they we would put games together for the local members, and on a given weekend, uh, you know, if they they had one spot available, they would send an, an assistant out there to play. And it just so happened that I played both on Saturday and Sunday, and I shot 64 one day and 65 the next day. And I was just, I was playing really well. I was sort of driven. Um, and Hal will remember this. This was also at a time where everybody was sort of making their swing to the Mac O'Grady, the Morad system. Um, and I, I, you know, fell right into that. And so I was working on all that stuff, uh, not with Mac, but um, with everybody at the, at the, who was on the staff there. And so I was, I was working hard on my game. I was playing a lot every night. Uh, every morning I would get there early, hit some balls. I made sure that I kept my game up, and I, I was fortunate enough to be able to play pretty good. Well, no wonder you've been such a success. You were never afraid of work, were you, Michael? No, you know, my, my, um, my dad told me at a very young age, I was 17 years of age, he said to me, look, it, it doesn't matter what you do for a living as long as you find the, the, one, the one thing that you're passionate about and then don't let anybody outwork you. And as long as you outwork people, you're going to be fine. And it stuck with me. It was something that, that registered, hey, all I, it's, all I have to do is figure out what I want to do, what I love to do, and then just work my tail off at it. And, and that model has, has proved to be pretty good. I know it's been pretty good for you as well. It's been pretty good for me too. Yeah. So, so Michael, you mentioned working at Augusta and it was kind of at a, at a, a different time and they were kind of segueing into growing the game a little bit more than just, just trying to beat people. Well, we're kind of in, in a different time now, you know, with yeah. us being able to do this and Zoom calls and FaceTime calls and with COVID and all that stuff, the online lessons and the, the uh, online golf instruction, digital golf instruction has taken off. And I, I think you're one of the godfathers. You were one of the, one of the, the early guys into that game. Um, obviously with you being the chief digital instructor with golf digest, um, you know, talk a little bit about where, you know, what your ideas were with that when you kind of got started into all this stuff and, you know, kind of where we're at now and where, where you think we're headed. So, um, and, and again, Chase, you're probably a little young to, to remember all this, but Hal and I are about the same age. And so this will make total sense to him. When I, um, when I, got offered the opportunity to host the golf fix on golf channel. This goes back to 2008. And I started working with golf channel back in 2000 doing on course commentary for them. And, and um, I, I had some really good breaks, which is what happens in life, right? Your relationship with Hal is something that's going to help you get to where you want to get to and your hard work and perseverance is what will carry you through in your career. And the same thing happened to me. And um, what happened when I got offered the golf fix and we started to, to look at what was happening with our viewership and our viewership um, was higher than any instructional program that they'd ever had in their entire existence. Um, what started happening was people started recording our show a lot. Uh, so we would have an audience of say, uh, you know, I'll, I'll make it up 0.16 um, and then that started to dwindle, but we started seeing more and more um, reaches out through emails and things like that. And we started to realize that people were DVRing the program and watching it when they wanted to watch it. And what dawned on me was that, that and, and I've, I've spent a lot of time in my career putting together one-year plans and five-year plans. What's the world going to look like in a year? What's the world going to look like in five years? And I have a notebook that I have carried with me for a long time, in fact, I have, I have probably seven of them now um, in my uh, backpack that I would just make notes on, on different instructional ideas or different show ideas or where the world's going or whatever. And so I started to kind of take a really in-depth look at where I thought the instructional space was headed. And, and what dawned on me was people wanted instruction, but they wanted it on their time instead of on my time. It's now called appointment television. And so what I started doing was I started trying to figure out how was I going to be able to stay ahead of everybody else. I looked at it like I had a head start. I was given the opportunity to host an instructional show all by myself, not with a co-host. It was my show and only my show. Throw it to break, learn the television um, industry, all that other stuff. And it was really, really successful. When they sold the show to the advertisers, they sold it at a .04 
and we were doing 0.12s and 0.13s in our first year, which was three times the audience that they had anticipated. So I kind of knew we had we had something, but I didn't know what it was. And then I finally put everything together and figured out, okay, this is where it's all going to go. And how can I keep my head start? I'm the only one that's in this space. I'm the only one that's doing this stuff. How can I keep the head start that I was spotted? It's like, you know, go to the Olympics that we just finished watching. If you gave somebody a one length uh, head start in any swim, they should win. And if they don't win, then they're not prepared. And so that was kind of, that's been my mindset. I have the head start. I have been given the gift. I've been given the relationships. How do I hold on to that? And through a lot of research and a lot of um, conversations with television producers and people like that, just being inquisitive and asking a lot of questions of the right people, I started to figure out this is where the world is, is going to go. And so how can I, how can I beat that world? And um, I, I, I've been able to, to um, maintain that lead a little bit. I think that there have been a lot of people who have done really, really well in this space. Um, but nobody has done what I have done with the studio that I've built and all the different things that I've, that I have done as a result. And I would, I would also say that the, and Hal knows this as well. And I know you know this as well. You're only as good as the team that you have around you. And what I have been able to do is I've been able to sort of form a, a board. What I did for me was I had a personal board of people that I put together that were my reaches. And I would, I would call these five individuals all the time and go, what do you think of this? What do you think of that? Where is this going? And I just kept using my board to get me going in the direction that I wanted to go in, which was ultimately not traveling. I've never lived anywhere other than um, during the course of, of the golf fix, anywhere other than in Connecticut. And I commuted from Connecticut to Orlando, Florida for a decade. Um, jumping on a plane every Sunday night and, you know, doing that whole thing and realized that that was not the model that I wanted to have when everybody was, was recording. So I started, you know, my, my note taking and, and, and my interviewing and all that different stuff and ended up where I am. So one, one quick follow-up, put your, put yourself now in the mind of a 20 handicap, a 10 handicap, a five handicap. What are the, what are the pitfalls? We get a lot of students that come in here and say they're self-taught and they're, they're DIYers, right? And they, they go down the YouTube path or they go down this, this path of Instagram instruction and, and, and some of the golf fix stuff and what, what you did. Cause it's, we, we also say all the time, like it's really hard for us to just put out a video series or put out a book because we don't know the patient that's reading the book or we don't know the patient that's, that's listening to the video. Talk about from a student's perspective, like what do you think, how, how could our listeners at home get better at filtering through the information that's out there? Well, I think the first thing that you have to have is introspection, right? You have to be able to look at your game and go, what are the things that I think I need to improve? You asked this question, Hal asked this question, me and my uh, team of coaches at my academy asked this question all the time, which is, you know, give me an idea of where your handicap is. And they go, well, I'm a 12 handicap. And, and our follow-up question to that is, okay, let's look at handicaps differently. I want you to handicap each part of your game. What's your handicap with a driver? What's your handicap with an iron? What's your handicap with putting, chipping, pitching, bunker play, miscellaneous shots, um, course management, brains, you know, how's your mind working on there? And all of a sudden you start to see this range of handicaps and we have an evaluation uh, that we put all of our students through and then we take them on the golf course and then we evaluate them. So we have a, there's a thing called a 360 evaluation, which is very popular in the business space. And it basically is everybody evaluates everybody. And we use it, what I'll call a 360 evaluation for our students. So how do they evaluate themselves? And then how do we evaluate them? And then we come to the conclusion, hey, you're not as bad a driver as you think you are, but where you really run into problems is um, your iron play is bad, or you don't have any course management or whatever it is. And then that kind of, that's your jumping off point. So that's the first thing that I would say. You have to have introspection. And that is, what are the things that you think that you need to improve upon to play better? And then from there, you start seeking the wisdom of individuals who you trust. And 
to me, that's a big, big word, the word trust. How do we find somebody that we trust in an online space? Now, I can tell you, and again, Hal knows Chuck Cook very well. Uh, I, I don't know whether you know Chuck or not, but I, I've had this, I've sat on a number of committees with the PGA with Chuck Cook about this. And I've said, Chuck, this is where the world is going. Here's the, here's the statistics, just so that everybody understands. Of the 100% of the people that play the game of golf, less than 10% go and take golf lessons. So let's just say it is 10%. Let's, let's say 90% don't take golf lessons. That has not changed in 30 years. That statistic hasn't changed in 30 years. But people want to get information. So how do they get information that's going to help them? And how do we as coaches provide the information that's going to help them improve? And this is what I talked to Chuck about. I said to Chuck, this is years ago, Chuck, this is where I'm going to go. And he goes, well, I'm not going there. And I go, well, you're going to be a dinosaur. And he goes, well, I'm not going to be a dinosaur. And I go, yeah, you are. And he goes, why? And I go, because if you get hurt, you don't make any money. But if I get hurt, I make money because I put stuff out there in a way that allows sponsors to get behind it, that allows students to, to purchase it one way or another. And so I make money when I sleep. He makes money when he's, when he's working, when he's upright. And that, that model, that dinosaur model is, is going away. Now, it doesn't mean that people aren't coming to your academies and my academy. That, that doesn't mean that. What it means is, is that the large majority of the people aren't doing it. And so the question is, if you really want to grow the game of golf, and I go back to that thing and I said at Augusta National, if you really want to grow the game of golf, you have to be in that space as a coach. And then as a student, you have to understand what it is that you need in order for you to get better. Now, let me wipe that clean, that, that uh, board clean for just a second. We all know that nobody can hit a fairway bunker shot. We all know that everybody struggles with bunker shots. We all know that everybody struggles with course management, right? So if, if I were to try to create the, the one food that everybody would eat and they would love to eat, right? Is there one food group that everybody loves to eat? Well, you could argue fruit, vegetables, Italian food, right? You can get into all these different arguments, whatever they may be. Here's what I can tell you. There are certain things in the game of golf that everybody is trying to improve. One, they want consistency. Two, they want distance. And three, they want to get rid of their slice. That's a fact. And if you don't think that's a fact, just go to any public golf course in our country and look at where the cart paths are. And you'll see that when possible, cart paths are on the right-hand side. And the reason why is in the U.S., 90% of the people who play the game of golf are right-handed. And of that 90%, 85% slice. And so they're going to put the cart path on the right-hand side. So if you can, can create product, consumable product, that solves those three issues and also runs into the, the mental side of the game, the emotional side of the game, all that stuff, then you're going to take care of a lot of different people. And then with those students delving into what they need to work on, that what they need to improve upon, and you thinking, hey, what is it that somebody needs to do to improve? Now you release that information out there, and all of a sudden they're going to get better. And I'll tell you the other thing that is always of interest to a golfer, and that is what other golfers are working on. Explaining what getting stuck means. People don't know, they know the terminology. They don't know why people get stuck, right? So you as a coach, if you put out information that is, okay, here's what getting stuck is all about. Here's how you get unstuck. Here's what over the top is. Here's how you get out from being over the top. Here's how you get under the top, which is what we did a thing on. And all of a sudden people start going, okay, I like this information. This is information that makes sense to me. And this can help me with my game. And the other thing that I would say is, is that if, as, as a student, if it doesn't seem applicable, don't watch it. And that, those, those, that, that sort of, in a big broad stroke, how, how people can consume this information and, and get better. Well, thoughts? <clears throat> well, I love everything you said. And I do believe that probably the digital space is, is a much needed area. Uh, I like the way you call Chuck Cook a dinosaur, not because he is, but because, you know, so many people, I mean, I'm 63 years old now, 
And I think one of the things that Chase and I have in, have enjoyed, I've, I've learned from Chase. And although I've been in a lot of different places than Chase has been, he understands things that I maybe subliminally knew something about. But to actually be able to put a definition to it from from data standpoint, from three-dimensional standpoint, all the things that you're talking about right now, basically, it's interested me. And, you know, you know as well as I know that tour players are fragile. So one of the questions that I wanted to ask you is, you've taught so many handicapped golfers and you've taught some tour players. So how do you handle them differently? Um, the answer is I – I don't handle them differently. I handle them the same. They're, everybody's fragile. Tour players are fragile. Um, regular amateurs are fragile. So here's how, I, here's how I teach. The first thing is I try to find out whether my student is a kinesthetic learner, whether they are an analytical learner, or whether they're a spatial learner. And, and I'll give you an example. So uh, a few years ago, Bronson Bragoon called me. And I, I kind of stepped out of the teaching um, the tour player. And, and the reason why is that at some point in tour golf, and I can't tell you when it changed, but I think it started changing um, in, the, in the 2000s. Uh, tour players started expecting coaches to go out to the tour event and follow them around the tour. And in large part, what happens with coaches and, and there was a time when I was teaching seven players on the PGA tour and, and also uh, one woman on the LPGA tour. And I was traveling with all the work I was doing. I was traveling 40 weeks a year and I just went, I'm going to kill myself. I, I can't, I can't do this. This is not, it's not a healthy lifestyle. When that all changed, what happened was tour players, um, started to expect their golf professional to be on property with them when they wanted. What also happened was um, there was this anticipation, this expectation that uh, it was constant watching, almost like, like an NFL team. They, they have their coach with them every single time they go. There was that, there was that, where are you? Why aren't you here? You have to be here for me. Well, that kind of constant monitoring is not much different than what you see at the amateur level. It really isn't. There's a, there's a fragility that, that all these, these players have. And in my opinion, one of the reasons why um, players nowadays are more fragile is because the coaches, um, they, don't, they don't arm the player with the ability to solve their issues when they're on the golf course. You learned how to play the game of golf by watching the ball. And you would go, and, and, and there's an instinct that you had that players of your era had where you would hit a ball and you would go, okay, um, I, I want to cut it. I, I got I to gotta get the club face open. I got to take this outside and get the club face open. If I get it inside and the club face is shut, I can't start it on the line that I want. And all of a sudden, you just figured out a motion to be able to get the golf ball to cooperate. And, and, and what I would say is, is that in large part, preparing yourself for a round of golf in a, in a tournament experience is, it was, sometimes it was warm up, sometimes it was practice when you were headed out to go play. Nowadays, you look at what's going on the tour and they, they all have their launch monitors with them and their coaches are with them as well. That's a different experience than what the amateur deals with. This is a long-winded way of saying that they're very, very similar. You got to, as a coach, you got to figure out when you're dealing with a student, whether they're spatial learners, whether they're analytical learners, or whether they're kinesthetic learners. And then what you have to be able to do is you have to be able to arm them with the information that's going to allow them to perform looking at what happens with the ball. You had it. You did that. The modern player, are they good at it? I would say probably not. They're more robotic. Um, you wouldn't see a guy like Dustin Johnson in your era. You wouldn't see a guy like Dustin Johnson shoot 80, 80, 78, withdraw from a tournament, and then the next week go on and win, finish second the next week, win, win, and win the FedEx Cup. 
what would happen typically is, is that there would be preparation. You'd be with your coach for a little while, then you'd go out on tour and you'd go and you'd make some money. And when you weren't playing that well, you either tried to, to solve it when you were in the middle of a round or you'd go and you'd go find your coach and you'd come back again a couple of weeks later and figure it out. The game is a different game now. There's no question about it. But there are similarities to success, and those similarities include understanding what a ball is doing and what is it telling you that's going on. And I would say if there is a difference between a tour pro and an amateur player, the tour pro, you can, do, can figure that out. The amateur doesn't quite understand the, the effect of the ball curving and then the cause of what made that do what it did. Well, I would add one thing to what you just said. What makes the tour player more fragile than the amateur player is he's got further to fall and more to lose and higher expectations. So all those things involved, that's why the game has changed because of the amount of money that's involved in it. And, and you know, we know as a player your time is limited and you better not miss out on any of it. You've got to be as good as you can be every time you go out. And, you know, uh, we dug it out of the ground. Our era dug it out of the ground. You know, you're right. We watched the ball flight. We made adjustments based on the ball flight. And, uh, you know, when we first started teaching here, you know, we'd have – we could open up into the outdoors and we'd have kids hit a shot and immediately look over to see what the data said. And I'm, like, screaming at them, watch the ball, watch the ball, because it's saying the same thing. See, then you have something to relate to, what the ball did and what the data says. But if all you want is the data, it's a, it's, it lacks emotion. It lacks uh, – and that's why Dustin Johnson was able to do what he was able to do, you know. Our fall from grace was difficult because it was harder to get there, if that makes any sense. Makes total sense. And the other thing I would say to you is, is that – and this is the strange thing because you were sort of in a transition in the game of golf professionally, in my opinion, and that is – in Nicholas's time, in Trevino's time, they played golf and you had to play great golf to be able to live. And then they started getting money into the game, lots of money, corporate investments and outings and all that other stuff. And all of a sudden you win a big tournament and it means a lot more away from the golf course. And there started to be a bit of a shift. Um, and that shift was, what can I make off the golf course. That's when agents started really coming into the game and really, really being a part of it. What happens now, and I think there really is a difference. Now they make 20%, they, they make 80% of their dollars and 20% of their tournaments. All they're trying to do is have three or four or five really good weeks. And that's why whole locations have been moved closer to uh, the edges of greens because it's a much more aggressive mindset. It was, hey, if I don't make the cut this week, no big deal. All I got to do is make a million dollars, a million three, and I'm going to be fine. And the way I'm going to do that is I'm going to, I'm going to have a couple of top fives in some tournaments and maybe hit one really good turn like Jim Hermans. I mean, you look at what Jim, Jim did and he, he misses cut after cut after cut after cut in a PGA Tour year and then goes out and wins. And he's got his card. And that doesn't make him a bad player. It just It's a different methodology. And the methodology, the mindset is hit it at every flag. And when you have your on weeks, you're going to shoot low scores and you're going to make a lot of money. And if you missed the cut, you missed the cut. No big deal. When I was playing, when you were playing, if you missed the cut, it was a big deal. It was expensive. Nowadays, it's a, it's a, different, it's a different game. Michael, you know, Hal talks a lot about how you know he might have only had his a game three or four times a year i mean don't, yeah. don't you think that that still kind of applies to the to the to the older school guys too i mean you know obviously tiger and jack were, were were different animals but you know you still saw you know even you take a phil mickelson back then winning one or two or three times a year still i mean how how is it i mean i we talked we talked a lot about the money stuff on here and how you know from decade golf trying to you know, get these guys, he actually, he would actually agree more with what you're saying in that if you can finish 15th every week, you're going to make so much money. It doesn't matter. You know, go, go hit it in the middle of the green and don't take on any undue risk. But then there are the guys that are firing at every flag and they're okay with that mindset of I, if I, if I can find a flash in the pan one or two times a year, I'll make plenty of money and be just fine. 
my question is, is golf, uh, golf isn't is any easier now than it was back then. Is it still this game's just so hard that you're never going to have your A game but two or three times a year? Um, that's a really interesting question, Chase. Here's what I would say. I would say there's a couple of things. One, and Hal, I'm, I'm asking this of you too, so please uh, participate in this, in, in this answer. I think one of the biggest differences between the tour player now and the tour player of, say, Hal's uh, generation or prior was you worked the ball both ways. Um, you played golf, curving it right to left or left to right. Uh, the trajectory of the shot was, uh, was um, a bit different in that you didn't commit solely to one shot shape. You kind of had a shot, but you didn't necessarily go to that shot all the time. You see players nowadays stand up on dog leg lefts with a driver in their hand and hit a cut down the left-hand side over a bunker, and they force the golf course to accept their shot shape. Players pretty much exclusively play single shape shots. Now, I go back to a guy that had great success that was a single shape uh, uh, hitter, and that was Bruce Litsky. And he, his mindset was, and this is why Litsky, I think, was eventually so good, was, first of all, he took a ton of time off. He was, he was before, he was, he was ahead of his time. He took a ton of time off. He exclusively hit the ball left to right. He had a mindset of, I'm going to get three bad hole locations that aren't going to work for me. I'm going to hit it in the middle of the green. Maybe I make a long putt, no big deal. But I'm going to get, I'm going to get uh, three that will be left hole locations, but I'm going to have clubs in my hand where the ball's not going to move a lot. So I'll have a wedge or I'll have a nine iron or a sand wedge, whatever it may be. Um, and then I'm going, to have, I'm going to have the rest of those 12 holes are going to be good for me. They'll be middle of the green or they'll be right edge greens. And those are shot shapes that I can, that I can work with and I can play to. And he hunted a lot. He took a lot of time off. We all are familiar with the story of uh, his caddy putting the banana under the head cover and six weeks later uh, or, or even longer, you know, opened up and the banana is still there. Um, that's, that's the modern game now. But if you go back a, a while ago, the, mod, the, the game of golf wasn't that way. And I think that's one of the reasons why players didn't have their A game all the time. But I also think, too, that's why they were, there were money. If, if you think back to even before Hal, the number of people that you would go, oh, he was a grinder. Oh, he was a grinder. He was a grinder. If you look at the game of golf now, we call it dirty. So there are, in, in, in our vernaculars, where we have pretty players and we have dirty players. And if you, if you think of dirty players right now, there's only a few. If you think of pretty players, guys that have really nice golf swings, have some good weeks, have some not so good weeks. Um, there's a lot of pretty players on the PGA Tour. A lot of beautiful golf swings to watch. There's not a lot of dirty players. If you go back to, to you know, when Hal first got out on tour and the players that were out there with him, there were a lot of dirty players. There were a lot of people that figured out how to get it in the hole. And I would, I would argue that Arnold Palmer was a dirty player, that Jack Nicklaus was a dirty player, that Lee Trevino was a dirty – I mean, you could go through a list of players, and they were very, very gritty, grinding, dirty players. And that's why, you know, when, when Hal says we, we ground it out of the dirt, yeah, because you were a grinder. You're going to figure out how to shoot a score. And, and I will tell you, and I've had Hal on, on my shows many times, and I've asked him this question many times. I get the same answer every time. Best shot he hit in his career. And he doesn't talk about a tee shot or an approach shot. It's a bunker shot in, the, in, in a competitive environment against Tiger Woods, and it's all about the grit and the grind. going to go, okay, I'm in for a fight. And he does. And that's the, the thing that the gritty, grindy player reflects upon. That's that's how's a dirty player. He got it done. One of the things that I say all the time, Michael, is is that we had to manage what we had for the week. And you know, you talked about the one shot shape. You know, I preferably hit a little bit of a fade with my driver and I hit a little bit of a draw with my irons. But that's what I preferred. And when I was doing that, I was playing my best. But that wasn't happening all the time. And I was managing whatever I had at the time. And, you know, usually, very seldomly, did I win a golf tournament when I was in management mode. You know, I was – I might finish in the top ten in management mode, 
but my goal was to cut my losses as much as I could and wait on those moments when I was on the money that I could be aggressive. And that's the way I played golf. And you had to because there wasn't that much money there for you. So, you know what? You making the cut was an important thing. And if you finished 31st, it was better than 41st because it meant that you had a little bit more money. I mean, that's literally the mindset. That's not, that doesn't exist now. Well, one of the things that meant a lot to us, and a lot of people listening to us doesn't know this, but our retirement plan, every time we made a cut, they put money into our retirement plan. So it wasn't just the money that they saw that you made. It was also the money that went into the retirement plan when you made the cut. They called it the cuts plan. And, you know, so there was money being made for your future when you made the cut. And by the way, I mean, Kurt Byram is a guy you know well. He's a friend of mine right. as well, I, a, a good friend. And he's, he, he came up in one of those levels of the cut plan. He's like two cuts short. And it drives him nuts to this point. Literally to this point, drives him nuts. You're 100% well, correct. I'm sure it does. But Kurt's a great guy. I love Kurt. Great. So, yeah. Michael, you mentioned – I'm going to circle back just real quickly because I want you to give our audience a, some definitions here. You mentioned what kind of making sure that students at home know what kind of learner they are. Are they a spatial learner, analytical learner, kinesthetic? Can you touch on those briefly? Yeah. So a spatial learner is somebody that um, when they get information, it, it processes in their brain um, correctly from a sort of imagery kind of mindset. They tend to be, uh, they tend to play a musical instrument. They tend to be entrepreneurial. They tend to visualize um, a lot easier. They like to read books. Um, they are very good um, mathematics students, not great in the English space, that type of thing. So when I, when I interview my students, and, and, and here's the easiest way to, to say this, okay? And, and again, this is something Hal will understand. Sevi Ballesteros was one of the great spatial learners that we've ever seen. You could give Sevi a golf club and ask him to hit a shot, and he'll, he'll go out and figure out how to, how to hit that shot. You, as a coach, can ruin the, spa the spatial mind if you give them analytical thoughts, which is what happened, in my opinion, to Sevi. Sevi got linked up with Mac O'Grady and he started chasing this motion. And Mac was a very analytical guy, an extremely analytical guy. If you looked at any of his stuff, it, you know, P2, you've got what is your knee doing? What's your elbow doing? What's your wrist doing? All these different things. And it, frankly, it, it, it in my opinion, it destroyed the talent that was Sevi Ballesteros. Now that doesn't mean that, that, uh, Mac did anything wrong. I, I don't think he understood that part of instruction. I think he basically went down a path that worked in his mind. And then he continued down there and shared that information with people that wanted it. And Seve wanted the information and Seve didn't know what he was doing. And the next thing you know, he's taking the genius out of Seve. So Se what, what basically what, what uh, happened with Seve was he stopped the range at, a, at an open championship with a wedge where everybody was trying to hit their sand wedge off the ground, it was so firm, and they couldn't get the ball up into the air to hit sort of a flop shot. And um, Seve was able to, to go out there, throw down a bucket of balls, take his, his 56 degree wedge, and start hitting flop shots up into the air. And everybody stopped and watched because they couldn't do it. It's a rare time. You see players uh, stop a range. Tiger Woods has stopped a range. Um, and, and I don't mean stop a range, but get people on the range to watch him hit shots. And that's what, what uh, Seve was able to do with his short game. Spatial players are going to be much more creative. Ben Crenshaw is a spatial player. That's why everybody loves, you know, his ability to visualize. That's why I think he's a great golf course architect. Analytical players are people that are much more comfortable with a, an analytical thought for a motion. Make sure that I get my elbow bent to 90 degrees. And they literally think about getting their elbow to 90 degrees at the top of their backswing. A spatial player is gonna think about, you know, pouring a water bottle um, over their shoulder at the top of a backswing for a wrist position or something along those lines. And so when you are working with 
spatial players versus analytical players, you, you have to make sure that as a coach that you don't ruin the spatial player. If I give an analytical player a spatial thought, I won't ruin them. If I give a spatial player an analytical thought, I'll ruin them because then they'll start thinking in that way. And that's when their brain doesn't work as well. Um, the kinesthetic player is much more aware of, of the, the things that, that are happening through a, a position. So I might take somebody and say, okay, and literally put them in a position at impact and go, okay, here you are at impact. Now arrive back to this position at impact and all their brain and their body communicate that way. And they all of a sudden put their body in a position and then go. A guy that's a kinesthetic learner um, is a Matt Wolf who fell into this pre-shot routine, right? And so he's, he's doing this bump forward to give his brain an idea of where his body is supposed to be. And then he just puts his body in that spot. So I, I kind of, when I work with these different players, I'm making sure that I know how they process information and then I teach them accordingly. Oh, what do you think you were? <laughs> I think I was a spatial learner really. I, I, but I'm intrigued by the analytical side of it. I, and I'm not afraid of it now because I'm not competing anymore. Does that make sense? Yeah, totally. And I think what would happen is, I mean, if we rewound the videotape and you reflected back to when you played your best, when you had your quote unquote A game, that was probably when you were in your spatial mode, much better. And I would say that's one of the reasons why you were able to execute that bunker shot at the Players Championship, because what happens when you get into a bunker is you're not thinking about what you're doing technically. You're just going, okay, I, get, I need to land it there, and I need this much energy to land it there, and how do I get the club to get into that spot? Well, I got to do this to get it to go there. And, and that's how you perform best. And I know that if you reflected back to certain shots, which I'm sure you can, and think about what was in your mind at the time, it will always be – okay, I got to hit it at that tree and, and move it left. Or I got to hit it at that tree and let it drop right. Or I got to land it there and put this spin on it or put this spin on it or whatever it may be. Dale Douglas would have been an analytical player. Dale Douglas would have been a guy who said, okay, I'm going to take this six iron. I'm going to land it at that spot. I'm going to go this far back. It's going to feel like a putting stroke. And I'm going to go there. Crenshaw, as I said before, very spatial. He, he had a great quote. When he was on his way to winning his uh, second Masters, he stood on 16 T and he said, I got there, Carl Jackson. And he said, it just felt like a six iron. Where Faldo got up there and he goes, you know what? It was the perfect yardage for a six iron. That's a different, that's, those two sentences are completely different deliveries on spatial versus analytical. Yeah, one of the things we talk about with our parents is, if, you know, especially dads to daughters, a lot of times dads are the engineers and the daughters are the artists or the dancers. And yeah. Like, Sorry, you're not going to be able to teach your putting, as the engineer, you're not going to be able to teach your putting method to your daughter that wants to dance and draw things. Like, it's just not going to work, you know? That's and exactly it's, right. There's a lot of, a lot of issues there. Um, Michael, what, what's one thing or a couple of things that, you know, if you could go back 20 years, if you, you wish you would have known then that you know now with regards to golf swing and instruction and all this stuff? Um, so this is a terrible answer to this question, Chase, but here's the truth. Okay. I wouldn't, I'll answer the question, but I got to answer it my way first. And then I'll answer it the way you want me to. I wouldn't change anything because what happened to me led me to this spot and I love where I am. And I am, I've never been in a better place in my life. Uh, and the last, uh, 15 years have been truly an amazing gift. And so all the hurdles and all the everythings that I had to climb and jump and, and deal with were all the reasons why I am where I am and why I, I uh, look at the world the way I look at the world and look at a golf swing and help people the way I would like that. So I wouldn't change any of it. Now, having said all that, what would I have, what would I have uh, changed in my life? Um, I would have been more open-minded is the easiest way to say it. Um, when not from a playing standpoint, but from a teaching standpoint. So when I was, was younger, and, and one of the things that I loved hearing from Hal when he said he's learned so much from you, what he basically is saying is he's an open-minded individual who's going to get information from anybody that he thinks is going to help him better himself. And that 
that mindset, if you're open-minded when you play, you, it will lead to confusion. I would rather have an individual, you know, there's that line, and again, I'm sure Hal has heard this, Jack Nicholas had all the answers, or, or knew all the answers, but he also knew Okay, this is the shot I'm going to hit. And somebody goes, no, 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 do, no, no. This is the shot I'm going to hit. And then they hit the shot. Um, so open-mindedness, in my opinion, you have to be able to listen to what somebody is going to say, but then you have to be able to shut it down and go, okay, this is what I'm going to do. And go back to having your A game. Your A game is when you are the least open-minded, in my opinion. You have the most conviction. You have the most trust. You have the most belief in everything you're going to do. And, and then you go out and you do it, and you're almost surprised when the ball doesn't cooperate. It literally is as if the, the world started spinning in a different direction. The, stun, the, the sun rose in the west versus rising in the east. You literally look at it with bewilderment. Couldn't agree with you more, Michael. I mean, I'm telling you, I thought I knew everything when I was on the money. And, yeah. you know, and I refused to listen to someone else about it because I was going to approach the shot with total conviction. I'm committed. I'm going to pull it off. A committed attitude is with, without any doubt is much better. Uh, you, you're just going to hit a better shot. That's usually the case. <laughs> Nicholas said, I would rather hit the wrong club with the right attitude than the right club with the wrong attitude. It's, and exactly. that's exactly what that is. And yeah. so what I would say is that, you know, when I was learning the golf swing, I kind of thought all I had to do was develop my thought process and then just commit to it. And everybody else was wrong, I was right. And what I learned in time, and this is the way I, I uh, again, I go back years now. What I have learned is I'm a chef. That's my job, I'm a chef. And I need to be able to make a pizza, I need to be able to make spaghetti. I also need to be able to make sushi. I need to make a hamburger. I need to make everything. And if I can make all those things, then I can be the restaurant that everybody will go to because I can provide them the nourishment that they seek. And so for me, as a coach, it's no longer, is Jim Hardy right or wrong? Is David Ledbetter right or wrong? Is Butch right or wrong? It's what are they doing that is right that I can impart that wisdom upon my students that can help them perform. And so my goal now is I just want to get information from everybody so that I can become wiser in what everybody else teaches. And if I can do that, then everybody will get better and I'll have the best restaurant around. So, so in essence, George Genkis, his recipe is pizza. Hardy's recipe is again, sushi. You mentioned, you know, all the, say the guys that, that I've had a certain pattern. Max model is this, and so you're you're basically you know you're you're arming yourself with as many recipes as possible to help as many different. You know, one of my my mentors always said, Chase, if all you have a if if all you have a hammer, if all you have is a hammer, then you better see nails every day. But the minute that that flathead screw comes in or that Phillips screw comes in, and you don't have a screwdriver, you can't help them. And so that's kind of echoing what you're saying. Hundred percent right. And I think one of the reasons that 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 turned to be the case is people started writing a lot of books. The very first instructional book was ever written 1857 by a guy named H.B. Farney. I actually own the book. And I can tell you that since that time, golf instruction of, of everything is the most analyzed. It's the, mo the golf swing, the short game, the air. it's the most analyzed everything. And there are more books out there about that stuff all over the place. And what happens is, is that when you write a book on how to hit a golf ball, you paint yourself into a corner of what you believe. And that's why I think, in my opinion, if I go through who's the best coach, Butch to me is the best coach. And one of the reasons why he's the best coach is you're hard pressed to find a book that he's written that paints himself into a corner about whatever it is that everybody thinks they should do, whether it's Jim McLean and the X factor, right? Jim wrote that book. Everybody was big on that book. And then all of a sudden 3d research showed that, you know, the X factor actually doesn't occur in the backswing it occurs in the downswing. And now all the Jim and Jim is a, first of all, he's a lovely man, but he's a fabulous coach. But now all he does is he, he, he has to defend that book, which was a great book. 
but everybody wants to vilify the book. And as a result, he has to defend the book. And he has to say, well, look, this is what I wrote. And, and I've known Jim a long time. And he did. He talked about how you've got to create separation. It happens in the downswing. Interpretation, whatever it may be, causes misinterpretation. And now he has to defend what he wrote. David Ledbetter went through the exact same thing. These people that have written these books, they have to defend them. The best part about um, Percy Boomer's book or Alex Morrison's book is they're dead. They don't have to defend themselves. They, don't, they just go out there and go, okay, this is what these guys believe. Go, okay, this is what they believe. For me, you're 100% right. If all you own is a hammer, then all you can do is nail. But if you have a screwdriver and a Phillips head and you have a saw and you have all these different things, you can build a house. What do you think – if we could, if, if you could get all your students to move a certain way, would you rather them have a perfect, a perfect pivot, pivot being body motion? Would you rather have them have perfect, perfect arm structure and wrist angles? So what's more important pivot, pivot versus let's say, let's say pivot versus arms, pivot versus upper body. So um, if you're asking me my preference in a golf swing, here's what I, here's what I would tell you. I, the big difference to me between the modern swing and the classic swing is the modern swing because of equipment. And I'm not talking about the golf ball. I'm talking about perimeter weighting. I'm talking about lightness and shaft. I'm talking about grip technology, all these different things. Because of that, they don't have to work as hard to elevate a golf ball up into the air. If you go back to, um, you know, everybody talks about distance being the biggest advantage. I think the biggest advantage is elevation. I think trajectory is the biggest advantage. There are no hazards in the air. All the hazards are on the ground. And when the game of golf was a low game back when, uh, even before that, I'll, I'll go back to Willie Park back in the you know, late 1800s, early 1900s. Um, the game was a low game. You avoided, you didn't hit it over a bunker, you hit it around a bunker. Uh, but now everybody elevates the ball up into the air. Once you start elevating the ball up in the air, green dimensions change. If I have a ball that is, that is uh, descending into a green at 52 degrees, it's going gonna, it's gonna to stay closer to its, its initial touch point on the green than uh, if it's coming in at 30 degrees, right? So pretty simple. So Equipment has really helped change the, the, the game, the, the swing. But my preference is this. I like using um, a wrist angle, a club face position, a shut face. I, I, I like square to shut face. And then I like, and what I like to say is you create impact in the backswing and then you transport impact to impact in the downswing and you'll hit more consistent uh, shots, more predictable shots. And I mean predictable, I'm talking about a shot shape or a trajectory or an apex or a spin rate or whatever it may be. And so for me, I think wrist angles are important and I think body rotation is important, but I go back to the most important, if you ask me between those two, wrist angle is way more important because it controls face. I don't see body rotation necessarily control face. I see lack of body rotation or exaggerated body rotation um, have more of an effect on what happens with path than it does on face. I see wrist angles have more of an effect on what goes on with face. And I'm a face first guy. I, that, that's what I call the money maker. The face to me is the money maker. So my preference is get, get control of the club face, learn how the club face affects a golf ball, work from, I, I, I always say ball to body. Body, work from the ball to the face of the club to the wrists to the arms to the body that's a, I kind of work that way in my instruction and so my preference is controlling uh, what goes on with with the club face first we predicted that <laughs> <laughs> but all good players uh, you know one of my favorite things to do is to uh, put some data point up there on the from track man and move the range and then ask them where the ball went and you can tell real quick whether a person knows where that club face is at or not and you know the better players know where that club face is at you should be able to and i'm sure you've done this we've all done this but hal you've done this better than certainly than 
than most and obviously better than we have. You should be able to play golf at, you know, sunset, not see the ball and know where you hit the ball. And to me, one of the things that I like to do with my juniors is literally send them out to go play one and nine or 10 and 18 uh, at sunset with one ball and see how far they get. And they should be able to, to perform. They should be able to hit that ball and go, okay, it felt this way or it felt that way and, and go to where, you know what, I hit it solidly, so it's going to carry this far. I didn't hit it so well, so it should be short of that. It should be on the right. It should be on the left. And when they can go out there and they can play one ball in those two whole uh, things and they can do it for an extended period of time, now I know I got a player that really can feel the face. I uh, totally agree with you on that. You know, I, every good player that I ever knew, they they knew when their head came up, they knew right where to look. Yep. Because they knew where the club face was at. Yep. And, you know, I was talking to Hogan one time, and he was talking to me about trajectory. And he said, Hal, he said, when you really get this right, you'll be able to build a building out there in front of you that's nine stories high and you'll be able to put whatever club you want through whatever window you want to put it through because you know where the club face is at. Yep. So there it is from maybe the best ball striker that ever lived. And I'll tell you one of the things that I'll do, which is very, very strange. This is a strange thing, but this gives me great success. My better players that are over 20, I have them learn to shave in the shower. So if you think about when you learned to shave, what you did was you looked in a mirror and then you shaved and you go into the shower and you take it away. And all of a sudden now you're forced to be able to see your face in your eye, in your mind's eye. And, and you, you can feel the, the razor on your face and you know how to move it and you know where you've gone and you know what you, what you've hit and what you've missed. And when my good players can shave in the shower without cutting themselves, now I know that they can step away from their eye and use their mind's eye. And that, the game of golf using the mind's eye, you can't believe, it's a little thing like that, but I know how. I know when, when, when you hear that, you go, you know what? It's different, but it, could, but it works. Uh, I, I totally understand what you're saying, but, you know, somebody might have to cut themselves. It could get bloody. <laughs> of course, Chase doesn't believe in any of that if you look at that beard on his face, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking about if my electric razor would, would work. Yeah. I just want to electrocute myself in the shower. <laughs> uh, that's, well, awesome. that, that's a great, that, that is a great way to think about it. Right. Especially in the both, both playing in the dark, but then also having the awareness and the, having the spatial awareness, having the kinesthetic awareness to be able to move around and, and, you know, obviously not harm yourself, but then, to have the field to take it to the golf course. You have well, to be to, able, sorry, Hal, go ahead. No, to your point on that, I was in the last group with Tiger when he won by seven shots or whatever it was at uh, Firestone when we finished in the dark. Yeah. Of course, there was a big rain delay. We were on the 18th hole, and I had to be in Jamaica the next day, and <sighs> But I was the only one that could lose any money because Tiger's got a seven-shot lead, and he's wanting to go finish. And it, it's dark. And he said, let's go finish. Let's go finish. And I said, well, I know you want to do this, but I'm the only guy that can lose any money. Well, if you recall, he hit it like two inches. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I hit mine a little bit heavy. I was just off the front of the green, and I got to get it up and down to not – I think I ended up finishing second. I can't really – I either finished second or third. But, anyway, long story short, I, I couldn't even see the flag. And if you know the 18th hole at Firestone, it's up and over a ridge to get to that pin. And I chipped it. I mean, I just said to myself, look, we know where the club face is at. We know how far this is. We just walked it. So, let's just hit this shot. Mm -hmm. And I chipped it a foot. And could not see the hole or the flag or anything else. So, I just made your point for you. That's it. It's exactly right. All right. Last question. Speed is obviously a huge, huge factor in the in the current current game of golf that we're playing now. Um, 
how do you teach it? And do you believe with young, with young juniors, do you think speed first and accuracy second? Or do you, do you think accuracy first or a mix of both? So when you say speed, are you ta you're talking club head speed? Yeah, club head speed, chasing distance, all that stuff. So um, I, I am a big believer in, I, 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 let me rewind the videotape again, right? So when I was younger, um, I played a lot of tennis. Uh, my, my grandfather was from New Orleans. Um, he grew up in a very impoverished part of, of New Orleans and through tennis was able to become a Davis Cup tennis player, um, is in seven halls of fame uh, and won a national open with his, with his brother. So tennis was sort of what I, I kind of grew up with. And when I learned tennis, there was... Um, there was a mindset of you just got to get it over. Tennis was a pretty sport uh, and you had to get the ball over the net. And so I had really good strokes, not a lot of power. And at seven, I beat everybody because I could get it over the net and at eight and nine and 10. And then when I turned 13, I started getting beat. And the reason why I was getting beat was because the guys that had grown up hitting the ball hard but couldn't get it in finally had figured out how to get it in. And all of a sudden, you take somebody that has pace and can get it in versus somebody that was, they use this term pusher, where you just pushed it back over the, over the, the net. All of a sudden, I was getting smoked. And it, and it played me out of the game of tennis, which I'm, again, thankful for. But what I learned through that is speed – Speed's the most important thing in every sport. And if you look at um, a pitcher, speed is power. If you look at a runner, speed is power. If you look at the difference between uh, high school football, college football, and professional football, it's a, it, it gets faster and faster and faster. Speed is the separator. And so what I want, and, and I'm going through this right now. I've got two boys that are eight and nine. And our whole thing is, and what I, I, I have all the numbers in my studio. The only thing I have them concerned on is ball speed. Because in order to get ball speed, you have to get club head speed and you have to get centeredness of strike. And so what I work on with my guys is just hit it hard. I don't care where it goes, just hit it hard. And swing as hard as you can. I don't care. If you top it, if you slice it, if you hook, I don't care. And what my guys can do now is they can control speed. And one of the, the, one of the things that, again, um, Hal, you, you know this well. It's a rare time when you go out and you play the game of golf where you have perfect numbers on every single shot. You have to be able – the game of golf at an elite level is controlling speed of the golf ball. And controlling the speed of the golf ball is controlling the face, controlling the strike point, controlling the shot shape. And what happens to players when they play is they don't know how to control speed. So what I want is I want fast speed and then I want controlled speed. And if I can get my players, when I can get my players to do both, now I have an elite level player because they'll eventually figure out how to get it into play. The other thing that's going on, and, and you all know this, is um, the, the game of golf is, is going through a big change. And the big changes, we're taking trees out. And there is less of a priority. Go to Firestone, uh, you know, 30 years ago and now play it now. Go to Wingfoot in 1985. 1984 and play it now and there's no the the need for for accuracy is being diminished and the statistics are supporting that so for me the whole thing is it's all speed and the best part about what's going on with Bryson DeChambeau and I will tell you this because I know that this is going to go down this path Bryson DeChambeau to me is a generational player he has shown the world that there's no such thing as a golf god, that you weren't gifted major club head speed or not, that it can be trained and you can train it. And he has led the way. He influenced Rory McIlroy to go chase club head speed. 
And what we learn now is club head speed is the most important part of all of this. You learn how to have great club head speed. You learn how to control club head speed. You'll learn how to control ball speed. You'll be a champion. Wow. Well, I know from my playing days, which is over and long past, I really had a good feeling about the week when it, I looked up and the ball left there real fast. But if the ball, if it looked like I could reach out and grab it, I knew I wasn't controlling everything that needed to be controlled. And, boy, I suffered. And every time that ball left there fast, I prayed for the wind to blow. And every time that ball left there slow, I, if the wind was blowing, I wanted to go back to bed. And that, <laughs> that ought to make your point for you. <laughs> well, and I'll tell you something else. And I got to go back to this. So you probably remember a guy named Vetus Gerolitis. He played uh -huh. during the time when McEnroe, Borg, and Connors all played. And he was taught by a guy named Harry Hopman. Harry Hopman was from Australia, and he was sort of the uh, Butch Harmon of uh, tennis instruction. Venus Gerolitis got at his at his very best, and he was a fast. I mean, he could really move. Um, so there wasn't. He felt like there wasn't a shot he couldn't get. He had a very good topspin forehand, but he had a weak backhand. Hopman taught him to hit a very flat backhand, which is uh, what Jimmy Connors played with, very flat backhand. McEnroe was able to control topspin. But when Borg came along, Borg changed the game of tennis. Borg changed the game of tennis in a lot of different ways. He started stringing his racket at 80 pounds. Everybody else was stringing at 60 or 62 pounds. He added massive topspin, which allowed him to swing the racket even faster and create faster ball speeds because he could he basically could lift the apex of the ball and still get it into the court. And all of a sudden, you have to play that close to the top of the net. And when Venus and I had a lot of conversations, he only won two Italian Opens. He never won a major championship. He's a guy who, after he got beat by, um, by Borg, uh, 16, he, he, he got beat by Borg 16 times in a row. I believe this story goes like this. He beat him on the 17th time. He goes into his press conference and he, and his press conference and he goes, nobody but nobody beats Vita Sherlitis 17 times in a row. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so Vita said to me his greatest regret in, in his game was that he couldn't hit a topspin uh, backhand because he could never pass anybody. He could never – hit the, the, the tennis ball at the speed that he needed to to get the ball by anybody. So what happened was when he got to the elite game, they would all hit it to his backhand, and all he could do was hit an undercut. And so he was forced to play a serve and volley game. That was the only way that he could keep people from hitting it to his backhand. And he could only run around his backhand so much. My point is, and, to, and, and in agreement with, with what you say, Hal, club head speed, ball speed is the separator in the game. And the Corey Pavins of the world are that's a that's a lost art, and it will continue to be that way, as we now know that what Bryson has done has showed that we can build club head speed. What do we have to do to do it? And then let's go about chasing it. So I am a big fan of speed first, accuracy second. Well, uh, I agree with you 100. percent So uh, this has been great. You're always entertaining. Your knowledge is deep and um, provocative, really. You know, you make me think every time we talk, Michael. I appreciate that. So, I, I will, Hal, if I could interrupt, I would just say this. You know, I, I long before we were friends, I was an admirer and a, a fan. Um, I've watched your skill set uh, with a golf club in your hand and, and thought to myself, man, could I do that? Obviously, I couldn't. And so it is a great pleasure. And I have said to you, anytime you ask, I'm going to say yes. It is a great pleasure to call you a friend and also to, to see you do what you're doing after uh, being one of the very best players to ever play the game of golf, um, to now see what you're doing in the instructional space. You're growing the game of golf, and, and uh, it is a pleasure to, to talk with you about this game anytime you – you call. I'm going to say yes. So thank you so much for having me on. And Chase, it's been a pleasure spending time with you as well. If if uh, if Hal has you on the team, you're on my team too. So whenever I can help, whatever I can do, just let me know. Thank you both. Thank you, Michael. Really appreciate that.
Thanks for being on, buddy. Thank you so much. All the best to, to you and your families. Thanks. You too. Thank you. Be the right club today. Yes!